In 2009, in Tracy, California, eight-year-old Sandra Cantu was caught on security camera playing in the sunshine outside her trailer home. Moments later, she seemingly banished off the face of the earth. Sadly, her body was found 10 days later. Whilst authorities initially suspected a male sex offender was responsible, the true identity of the perpetrator would prove far more shocking. This is what happens when an unlikely predator is hiding in plain sight. This is the case of Melissa Huckabee. No! Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. Today's case is one that you asked me to cover. And I have to say that when I started to research this, it turned my stomach and it was ultimately very shocking because it is a statistical anomaly, which makes it even more difficult to process. Obviously, this is gonna be about child abuse and child death, but just to remind all of you that the reason I cover these cases is I genuinely feel that we need to be aware of these kind of crimes and I truly feel that we need to give legacy to the victims because it is shocking that the most vulnerable in our society fall victim to these horrible chameleons and we have to talk about the reality of these kind of crimes, we really do. For those of you who are new to my channel, I release my content on a Wednesday and Sunday. So if you like crime and you like consistency, this is the channel for you. Big shout out to all of you supporting me on my YouTube membership and my Patreon. I can't do this without you, it's as simple as that. So you are massively appreciated as every single one of you who comes here and views my content, gives me a like, gets involved with the chat, comments, etc., are also so precious to me. I couldn't do it without any of you helping and supporting me. Let's get on with today's case. 28 year old single mum, Melissa Huckabee. That's who this is gonna concentrate on. So she came from a really good home. She came from Orange County, California. She had a very loving, very stable upbringing. And to all intents and purposes, she was considered a very loving mother. She had a very strong religious background. But I would say that in spite of the fact that she has these very good foundations and clearly an apparent strong faith, she did experience problems in her life. So she was divorced and unemployed. And when you think about the fact that she's very young, that demonstrates that clearly there have been issues in her life. And when she was pregnant at 22, she actually filed for bankruptcy. She had debts of around $26,000. That's a lot to have at that age. I mean, I think we all have to recognize that when you're in that much debt at that younger age, it's probably deeper than just simply wanting to spend money. There's probably something psychological going on there. At this point, because of her financial woes, she then moved in with her grandparents. Again, very demonstrative of a secure foundation, the fact that she can return to her grandparents in this situation. And she's actually living with them when this crime takes place. And that's in Orchard Estates Mobile Home Park in Tracy, California. What people said about her was that she was an individual who was a relative loner. She had a history of mental illness, and these included borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. So to be young and to be diagnosed with all of these issues, clearly that means that you have been seeking support and trying to understand your mental state. There's always a little bit of me when I look into these kind of classifications and I see several classifications given to an individual, there is a concern in my head that somebody is looking to be diagnosed consistently and a potential concern about overdiagnosis or inappropriate diagnosis. That noted, any of those issues that have just been talked about, that is not gonna make you a heinous killer. And I really struggle, I've said this before in my videos, when mental illness is kind of grouped in there as if it legitimizes the kind of actions that have taken place 
or it suggests that the destabilization of that mental state is going to cause the kind of actions that we're going to talk about today. Whilst very rarely people do have insanity pleas that are absolutely correct and they are out of their minds when they do something. Think about Andrea Yates. I've covered that particular content where she killed her children. Certainly she was not in her right mind at all. We have total sympathy and empathy for individuals like that. For the most part, that's very, very rare. And today's case, the mental illness has nothing to do essentially with the actions that are carried out. She was said to be somebody who was an attention seeker from a very early age. It was unusual the type of attention that she saw as well. So she would start fires. So there's a level of pyromania there and it's a massive red flag. And she would also harm herself. And that self-harm tended to be cuts on her ankles. So there's definitely an emotional struggle going on there. I've also seen interviews with a really close friend of her who grew up with her and she considered her to be quite a kind and compassionate young girl, but it feels like as she reaches adolescence and then onwards into adulthood, there are these really quite striking changes to her character. Now, she was actually due to appear in court on the 17th of April, 2009. And the reason for that was she needed to start a mental health programme. So it was a mental health programme that had been instituted for her because she had this three-year probation sentence. It was for petty theft. So it wasn't a huge criminal behaviour issue. But the fact is that we're seeing this high-level attention-seeking. We're seeing lots of diagnoses within her. And we're also noting that she's clearly struggling to some degree, or at least wanting people to consider that she's struggling. That's when we're seeing the self-harm. And when you think about some of the hallmarks for violent offenders, certainly criminal behavior in early adulthood and adolescence is a big red flag. So we're seeing a lot of red flags with this woman. Also, as regards the petty theft, She'd just gone ahead and pleaded no contest to that. So she was acknowledging that it was something that she'd been involved with. Now, her grandfather, he's called Clifford Lawless. He was a pastor of the small Clover Road Baptist Church. Now, that's located nearby the actual trailer park. Huckabee volunteered there as a Sunday school teacher, which obviously we would think is a commendable situation and certainly when people volunteer in those contexts that can be a really effective pro-social way of belonging to and giving meaning to your community. Having said that I have a real problem with a criminal being around children in that way. I appreciate that we always have to give people second chances but I think a Sunday school teacher stroke shoplifter stroke somebody who has numerous issues like starting fires is probably not the best type of individual to be educating young children. But that's just my thoughts. What are yours? So we have this situation where there's a whole heap of issues with the individual that I'm discussing so far. And certainly I am feeling concerned about her psychology, but mostly I'm concerned about her actions. I'm concerned about the way that she's acted prior to what we're going to talk about today, because it's indicative of some pretty problematic and troubling behavior. Now let's look at the victim. So we have eight-year-old Sandra Renee Cantu. She actually lives in the same trailer park as Huckabee. So obviously it's quite a small area and it gives people access to one another. And I guess there's a real community feel in those environments. So this gorgeous little girl, Sandra, she lives there with her mother, Maria Chavez. And Sandra was actually close friends with Huckabee's five-year-old daughter, Madison. So obviously this is a child that trusts the environment because Madison is her friend and therefore Madison's mother is somebody that she will know. They actually live just five doors apart. She was considered to be a really lively, really happy child. People describe her as having a very cheeky smile and everybody at the trailer park loved her. Simple as that. She was known to be a really positive influence as a child in the park and nobody had a bad word to say about her whatsoever. There were no behavioural issues, no social issues. She was just a really good kid. So we get to Friday, the 27th of March, 2009. Sandra comes home from school. She attends Melville S. Jacobson Elementary School. And this is where she's a second grade student. So she comes back, it's just an ordinary day. And she played at a friend's house before going back to her own home. Now at 4 p.m. that day, 
she tells the mum that she's off to play at another friend's home. And of course, this is completely normal. It's what you want with your children. You want them to be able to feel safe in their environment. So she skips off to go and play at this other friend's. But she doesn't come home for dinner. And her mother is instantly worried. She knows that this is not typical behaviour. Her daughter does not act in this manner. And because she's not come home, she's immediately suspicious about the reasons behind that. So her mother then instantly starts to look everywhere, literally everywhere for her, but she can't find her. And she just has that feeling in the pit of her stomach that something is terribly wrong. It's so out of character for her. And she reports her missing at 7.53 p.m. She's frantic. She's desperate. This is not like her daughter. She just has that feeling that something truly horrific has happened. Now, it's an instant reaction. Absolutely instantaneous. The police, hundreds of volunteers, they start searching for this missing eight-year-old girl. The FBI also join the investigation. So they know they're not dealing with a runaway. They're not dealing with a situation where this child has just decided that they're going to go and play somewhere else. They feel there is either a malevolent reason why this child has disappeared or an accident that has potentially occurred. Either way, they know that it is important and time is of the essence and they all come together to do this. They have pictures of this little girl who's missing posted all over Tracy and police then start the door-to-door -door conversations with the residents of the trailer park. This includes with Huckabee and they actually speak with Huckabee on more than one occasion. And the likelihood is that the reason they speak to her more than a few times is because her daughter and Sandra are such good friends. And obviously kids hear conversations and kids have different relationships with one another than they do with their parents. So the more that you can elicit that information, the more you can create this pen portrait of possibility as to where that child might have ended up. Now, from the get-go, they thought Huckabee's behaviour was really off. It was really unusual. But at the time, they just put it down to attention-seeking behaviour. And they said that that's not uncommon. There are often in these cases, which are really tragic and terrifying for people involved, that there are people who just want to insert themselves in that situation. They do it for the drama. They want to be seen as integral and important. And this is quite common in the investigations that they get involved in. So they don't feel at this point that Huckabee is standing out for any other reason than that. Now, on the day that Sandra actually vanished, Huckabee sent a really strange text to her mum. She said, tell the police I had something stolen today around 4 p.m. I don't know if that makes a difference or not. Now, on face value, you could say, OK, well, that's not completely outlandish. Maybe she did have something stolen at that moment in time. And she's thinking, well, that's suspicious. Maybe I need to inform the authorities that this has taken place so they can check things out because it might have a relation to this little girl going missing. But why would you text somebody in your family when actually you can just call the police? If you're that concerned about a potential relationship with a missing item of yours, and the disappearance of this child, you're the direct individual who should be responsible for relaying that information. The fact that she's bypassing the authorities in that way, that immediately speaks to me of somebody wanting to create a web of potential innocence, somebody who's trying to act like they are naive and don't really know what's happening and just want to be really helpful when actually there was a subtext to that behaviour. Now, police are obviously hot on figuring out what has happened to this little girl, so they start trailing through hours and hours of security camera footage, which is from the trailer park. They have good CCTV. They are able really quickly to identify Sandra. So she's playing on the trailer park and she's on the grounds outside the home of hers, which is on the afternoon of her disappearance. So she's really close to where she lives. She looks really happy. She looks really carefree. Apparently she was hopping and skipping around in the sunshine, which is just an idyllic scene to imagine, isn't it? Because, you know, it's gorgeous weather. She's young, she's carefree. She's not thinking about any responsibility. She's just being a child and she's just welcoming those feelings that you have in childhood where everything is in the moment. And the fact that those images are the last of her, it's heart-wrenching because all she was doing was being the child that she should have been allowed to be. The child that has that momentary pause in life to just be fully connected to the here and now. 
And what we're talking about today is how that amazing moment is stolen in the most macabre of ways. So they notice that in spite of this hopping and skipping and enjoying herself, something then looks like it's caught her attention and she just walks out of shot. When they put out what she was last wearing, because they obviously have that in the CCTV, she's last seen in a pink Hello Kitty t-shirt and she's wearing black leggings. So they can ultimately see exactly where she was and then where she vanished, essentially. She's not seen again. Now, understandably, at the moment in time where they start this investigation, they have a theory as police. Their theory is this is a sex offender. Somebody has likely kidnapped Sandra. That's why she's disappeared. And obviously, they're deeply concerned about what might be happening to her or what might ultimately have been a tragedy because this sex offender has taken her and maybe killed her. But they do these inquiries. They go and speak to the known male sex offenders in the area brings no results at all. Every single suspect that they talk to has a solid alibi. Now, of course, just because somebody has got a previous conviction of a sex offence doesn't mean that they're the only contender for this kind of crime. The reality is that there are lots of sex offenders who will never actually be caught. So it doesn't go without saying that these are the individuals who would be the most likely candidates because there are so many other candidates and the police will know that just because they've interviewed and excluded known sex offenders doesn't mean there aren't many more in that area who could have harmed her. But essentially that starts to cause some concern because they automatically believe that there was a stronger preference as far as these individuals being potential criminals in this case. And with the hours that are passing and Sandra not being returned, more and more, they start to fear the worst. Now, the break, that comes on the second day of the investigation. So they're doing this vigil for Sandra because everyone is rocked to the core that this child, this delightful, loved, happy child, has just disappeared. And you can feel that the community is really mourning for her already. Because we all know 24 hours is a key time for a child to be returned safely. When it goes past that, often the outcome is the worst outcome that we could ever envisage and ever imagine. So during this vigil, where the community is mourning this child already, Huckabee approaches the police and approaches the FBI agents and says, hey, I found this note. I found a note on the floor of the grounds of the trailer park. She said it was found around where the community mailboxes are. Now, one of the things that the officers immediately noticed was the way she was being was very strange. She was in this highly agitated state. She was crying, she was hyperventilating. And I suppose one could argue, well, Emma, if she's got borderline personality disorder and she's dealing with incredible emotion, she's struggling to regulate that would be contextual towards her diagnosis. But I don't buy that. This is about creating an act that she feels the investigators will buy into. Again, another little breadcrumb of I am innocent, I am caring, I am somebody who has compassion, all I want best for this child. And the reality is, as opposed to it confirming her innocence in that moment, it actually starts to make the police suspect her because it doesn't feel in context with what's going on. So she passes over this really badly written note, it's very badly spelled, and it says, Cantu locked in Stalin suitcase, thrown in water on Bacchetti Road and Whitehall Road, witness. That's what it says, which kind of doesn't really make a lot of sense, obviously, but one could argue that somebody has purposely written it in a way that suggests a level of illiteracy because they are trying to deflect from the reality potentially of the person who did write the actual statement themselves. And obviously when the police look at this and look at her, they're starting to think this feels a really strange thing. It feels like there must be some kind of connection with this particular person who's handing us this note. Now, the location that is evidenced in that particular statement, in that written statement, it's in a site which is off an irrigation pond, and that's about several miles from the trailer park. 
basically it's a place that's filled with cow urine and cow manure so a really unpleasant place essentially bear in mind until huckabee had actually passed that note to them she wasn't a suspect yes they thought she was somebody who wanted some attention she wanted to insert herself in the investigation she was being dramatic to some degree but she wasn't somebody they were looking at and thinking yeah this sunday school teacher is certainly going to be number one on our radar potentially as a murderer but that action it just triggers something now when they were looking at the profile of the individual that they believed was going to be responsible for this murder it's very distinct to her because an fbi criminal profiler they said that the suspected offender would have been a white male aged between 25 and 40 with a history of sexual offenses or child pornography but huckabee's obviously female don't get me wrong she's white and also she's somebody within that age frame and she could well have had sexual offences or child pornography in her background but she's certainly not male but the minute that she hands them that note they're immediately suspicious first of all it's a really windy day so it's really unlikely that this note would just have conveniently been lying on the ground and on top of this what a massive coincidence the woman whose suitcase has been stolen just happened to find the note I mean, maybe some of you should be asking her for the lottery numbers because this is kind of an unusual synergy of luck where this person is being able to evidence all these things that could be relational to the case. It just pangs straight away of deception and somebody trying to deflect and suggest that there is an alternate reason for this child going away, such as a stranger coming and removing her after stealing the case from her home. The fact that now... We have a note which is advising that the missing child is actually in the very same suitcase that's been stolen, deeply concerning. And as I said, when I read that note out, you can kind of almost feel that somebody's tried to make it sound like somebody isn't very literate. And essentially, they start thinking this is somebody trying to disguise their writing. It's as simple as that. But obviously, they take it seriously that this child's body may be in a suitcase in that area. So then they have to start this really laborious task of draining the irrigation pond because they have to look to see whether this case is there and whether they can return the child's body. And whilst that's happening, which is obviously going to take some time, the investigators start to focus in on Huckabee. So they start reviewing the security footage of Sandra's last known movements. So first of all, they know that at 3.54 p.m. she stops playing and that's when she seems to be distracted or has the attention taken by somebody else and they notice that the actual attention goes in the direction of Huckabee's trailer. And then when she's walking out of shot, it's clear that she's actually walking out of shot towards Huckabee's trailer. And meanwhile, to actually get in and out of the trailer park, which is just literally covered in security cameras, there's only one way in and one way out. So eight minutes after Sandra's basically been seen on the camera, Huckabee leaves the trailer park. She leaves it in her Kia Sportage SUV. Now, at the same time, she contacts the trailer park manager. And this is all happening in a very short space of time. And she actually tells him at this point that her black Eddie Bauer suitcase has been stolen. So the police are now starting to add this up and starting to get really concerned about this particular individual's relationship towards Sandra and also the possible issues that they are starting to formulate in their mind may have played out, i.e. that Sandra has been taken by Huckabee. So the police and FBI then speak to Huckabee because they want to obviously figure out her movements that day. So she's quite open with them at that point. She says, yeah, I definitely left the trailer park and I actually went to the nearby church, which is where I'm a Sunday school teacher. And she said that she needed to do some general cleaning. She needed to do some admin for these upcoming church programs she was involved in. And she claims after that, she went and returned to the trailer park. The problem is, of course, the evidence suggests otherwise. 
So Huckabee's car does actually leave the church grounds about an hour and a half after leaving the trailer park. So this is about 5.30 p.m. But instead of heading back towards the trailer park, she's driven in the opposite direction. And that direction is towards the location of the irrigation pond where, sadly, Sandra's body is going to be found. And she's then captured returning back to the church about half an hour later, about 6 p.m. So she's actively avoided telling the FBI the truth. It's as simple as that. So now the police get a warrant to search Huckabee's car. And at the time that they actually are able to search Huckabee's car, the vehicle's actually on hospital grounds in Tracy. And the reason for that is about several days after Sandra's disappearance, which is on the 4th of April, 2009, Huckabee's checked herself into hospital because she's swallowed a razor blade. Now the investigators take that very seriously because they feel that that is something known as consciousness of guilt. So she's acted in this way because she has this guilty conscience and she's aware that the net is closing in, so to speak, and it's a way of her psychologically managing the reality of her actions. Huckabee, of course, denies this. She says that she'd accidentally swallowed the blade while sleepwalking which if I had the potential of doing would mean that all of my cabinets with such sharp implements were locked and bolted in a way that I could not enter any of those to attack myself with such implements. Imagine swallowing a razor blade. Don't get me wrong, I've worked with individuals who self-harm and they have done some horrendous things to themselves, but I've never yet had anybody do it whilst they were sleeping. Now, when they're searching the car on the hospital grounds, in the actual glove compartment, they find a post-it note. And that post-it note has writing on it. And that writing's actually been crossed out. And several of the words were actually the same as those that appeared on the note that she'd allegedly found earlier on and that she'd handed over to the investigators. You know, the one that claimed Sandra's body was in the stolen suitcase. And it was particularly the words Bacchetti Road and Whitehall Road, and also the word water. Because when we write, even if we're trying to disguise our writing, we are still writing it. So essentially we have certain ways of forming letters. And even when we're trying to disguise it, it's unavoidable that we relate to the way that we normally do it. And that means that somebody under handwriting analysis can pretty much pick out when somebody has created something and fabricated that it's somebody else. This is why wills that have been obviously fraudulently changed often are discovered because it is the person's writing that is unique like a fingerprint to them. It's very difficult to fraudulently do any changes to something unless you have the actual person doing it themselves because they arguably have this unique way of writing. So the investigators, they believe that she'd used this post-it note because she was trying to practice composing the notes that she wanted to give to the police. So she wanted to practice disguising her handwriting, but as noted, she had a really distinctive way of writing certain letters, so that was essentially impossible. But again, what is that telling you? It's not telling you somebody who's chaotic. It's not telling you somebody who's out of their mind. They're not going through some psychotic break. This is somebody who is manipulative and is also planning. This is premeditated. The reality of her actions are showing you that she knows what she is intending to do and why she is intending to do it. Now, of course, they've been dealing with the irrigation pond and that black suitcase actually gets revealed on the 6th of April 2009. So Sandra had been missing for a gut-wrenchingly, devastatingly 10 days. You can't even begin to compute how her family must have been managing that situation. The gorgeous little girl having disappeared, the fears of what she had endured, the fear that she's not coming home and then waiting for that confirmation. And then essentially after 10 days, finally getting the most horrific confirmation you could ever envisage or imagine. Now, when they get the case at the scene, they don't open it. And the reason for that is they don't want to have any issues with forensics. They want to preserve all the potential evidence that they can, but it's heavy. And because it's heavy, they kind of fear the worst. At this point, they place the suspected body of Sandra that's in the case into a body bag. And then it's up to the coroner who has to actually open the case. And of course, at that point, they do really sadly discover Sandra's body. And it's actually been tightly packed in a 
perfect fetal position is how it's described. The case had then been zipped up. And then to make it even more secure, a cord had been threaded through zips, which was going to help to hold it shut. And a blooded rag, which had even been soaked in alcohol, that had been found around her neck, been tied in a noose. And when they were able to establish what actually killed that poor little girl, it was strangulation. But they weren't the only injuries that she'd suffered. So she had a graze on her elbow. She had damage to her inside lip. That's consistent with a suffocation injury. But there's also this harrowing evidence of a very, very serious sexual assault. And it was severe. The damage to her external genitalia would have been utterly agonising and the coroner obviously has to make a call as to whether they were historic or whether they'd happened in the murder because clearly they could be two separate crimes but the coroner says absolutely under no circumstances did this happen prior to when she was murdered because we saw her skipping, we saw her playing on the security footage and the kind of injuries that they were looking at which were catastrophic they were things that would never have been able to allow a child to be having fun at that moment in time on CCTV because of the agony that they'd have been causing her. Also, the coroner realises that just the angle of penetration is problematic when you think about it being a sexual assault by, for example, a male member, because if a penis had actually caused those injuries, the angle that the damage occurred at wouldn't have been the angle that they saw in the injuries. So because of that, and because also there's no semen on the body, there's no semen on the clothing, the coroner believes that it's a foreign object of some kind. So this has been carried out using some kind of external object. Now, whilst in hospital, another thing that Huckabee does, because it's like she cannot stay away from this crime. And again, that's a massive red flag, isn't it? When we see a potential perpetrator who wants to insert themselves consistently at the scene of the crime, in the investigation of the crime, adding extra information to the crime, we're instantly alerted to the potential of them being guilty. So Huckabee ends up sending a series of really strange texts to her grandmother, Connie Lawless, and she was saying that she'd been watching the reports of the investigation from her hospital bed, which we know this is what serial killers do, particularly organized serial killers. They spend time literally obsessed with the cases because they know they're the ones who are responsible. And one of these texts actually says they're having an 815 news briefing on the suitcase. That was fast. I hope they didn't find anything. Another text that was sent later on said, I hope she wasn't sexually assaulted. Those when you're not actually directly involved with the case, when you're not part of the family, those are assumptions, presumptions, and suspicions that you're really not gonna voice. And actually the fact that she's tying both sexual assault and the suitcase together, that sparks of somebody who's guilty and of somebody who knows more than they should if they're an innocent party. So the investigators are now really fixated on Huckabee they start searching the church because obviously they know that they've had her on CCTV going there, leaving, coming back, etc. So they start to forensically analyse it. And one of the things that they notice is that the cords on the actual blinds in the church are a similar appearance to the one that's used to shut the suitcase. So now they're like tying the scene of the church with the scene of the crime. And then they look at the cords on the blind in the church kitchen and one of them's missing a plastic pull and it seems that it's actually been cut so then they're able to match the actual cord on the suitcase analyze it and connect it with the blind cord that was meant to be at the church so now they have this connecting her to the crime on top of this they're looking for that foreign object. What is it that could cause such damage to this little girl's genitalia? And they know that something's been used to violate Sandra. Now, the pathologist had said to them, look for something that's large and cylindrical, which again is just a harrowing description when we think about the context that I'm describing this in, a large cylindrical object. So they start to go through the drawers because any of you who've been to church, you'll be aware that there are often kitchens. They've got lots of utensils. They've got lots of things that you can use to bake, lots of things that you can make 
cakes with etc because you often have things in the church because they're community based and people do a lot of that work within the church kitchen itself and they actually find a metal rolling pin now that specifically was used to make unleavened bread for the lord's supper service that they'd have in church now at that moment in time when they find it they instantly are concerned because one of the handles on it is bent but on top of that they notice this smudge on it so then they send it off obviously for forensic analysis and it tests positive for sandra's dna so this large cylindrical object has now been located essentially it's in the church and it's got this little girl's dna on it they also search huckabee's home and at this point even further incriminating evidence is found so they find the notebook that belongs to her and on the cover it actually says cute but psycho isn't it weird when people have things like that that have either been bought by somebody for them which suggests a perception of their nature that's accurate or has been bought by them because they actually know it is their nature because she certainly is psycho there is no doubt about that and it says on that cover cute but psycho things will even out mm, a little bit telling i would suggest and when they look in that notepad the note paper actually matches the note that you know, Huckabee magically found with all that information about where they'd find Sandra's body. Also, there were indentations in the notebook itself because when you write in a notebook, obviously it goes through to other pages and it matched the text which was on that note. So they know that it was written in that book and then removed. They then go on and search her computer. And again, curiouser and curiouser. So it turns out that she'd read this report in September 2008 and it was a Israeli divers and they'd essentially found a suitcase with the remains of this missing four-year-old girl in it. So it's like she's prepping herself, she's rehearsing, she's considering potentials how to do this crime and carry it out. Now on top of doing the autopsy, obviously they do the toxicology on Sandra's body because they want to see whether she'd ingested any drugs and it turns out she had she'd taken alprazolam, which is a very strong, fast-acting tranquilizer, and I believe it's very popular in the States in particular. So essentially, this is quite a common drug. It's very strong, but it's not necessarily that difficult to access. And the fact that that's in her body, and it shouldn't be in her body, leads them to also believing that she was drugged before her murder. And in Huckabee's home, when they're searching, they find a purse, and that confirms that she actually is in possession of that medication. And in fact, that was one of many prescription drugs that she was taking. And on top of this, which is even more concerning now and linking her to the crime, the investigation was able to turn up the fact that it wasn't the first time Huckabee had actually been on the police radar in relation to prescription drugs. And this is really disturbing. So a couple of months earlier, since so on the 17th of January, 2009, a seven year old girl had vanished from the same trailer park in Tracy. Same age frame, same area. So obviously deeply suspicious that this happened a few months earlier. Now her mother had immediately reported her missing, but after she'd said that she was missing, she actually turned up shortly after. So that was a massive relief. But her mother questions her and says, you know, where on earth have you been? Because she's going to be fraught with fear and nerves and anxiety about what could have potentially befallen her child. And she actually says, oh, I was with Huckabee. Now, Huckabee claimed that she thought that the grandparents of the child had given the child permission to be with her. So basically, she's trying to project blame onto the child. Oh, I'm just being a really good citizen. I'm looking after your child. You know, I'm this lovely Sunday school teacher who everyone trusts so therefore when your child said that she was allowed to be with me I didn't question her but the mother was absolutely incandescent with rage first of all she didn't know Huckabee she had no relationship with her what is this strange woman doing hanging out with a seven-year-old child per se I think we can all agree 
we have no issues with being nice to other people's children, particularly if we've got a child of their age, but there is a very clear thing that you would do, which is ask permission. Even if the child is saying, my mum says I can come here, it's like, you would check it out. We're not talking about them living at wildly different addresses, it's the same site, it's a one minute job. Now, the mother of this child was absolutely relieved. She had got her daughter back. But after the few minutes of feeling that sense of relief, she starts to have this urgency because her daughter's not acting normal. She looks like she's drunk. She looks like she's under the influence of something. She's slurring her words. And she takes that child to the hospital because she's a really good mother in that respect. She wants to make sure that her child is okay. And it turns out that she tests positive for benzodiazepines. Now that particular antidepressant medication was another thing that Huckabee was being prescribed. Now the police are obviously informed. They go and see Huckabee and of course she is indignant that she had nothing to do with this. She denies any knowledge whatsoever. Now sadly for the mother of the child, she's known to have taken drugs in the past and she is essentially up against a he said, she said situation where Huckabee is this well-spoken Sunday school teacher and essentially the police decide that it's more likely that Huckabee's telling the truth. So the police don't take any action, despite the fact that this little seven-year-old kid is full of benzodiazepines that actually Huckabee has been prescribed. That in itself is a massive lapse of judgment where the police are concerned. I mean, they say that there was a lack of evidence, but arguably I think it's probably the bias of the past behaviour of the mother that makes them come to that conclusion. The mother themselves were absolutely angered by that decision and she went as far as to say you do not associate with Huckabee or her daughter ever again. So you can hear and feel that mother's intuition. She knew that Huckabee was a not right and she acted on that very important information. But what was Huckabee doing? It sounds like a rehearsal run, doesn't it? It sounds like her figuring out the amount of drugs required to space a child out. And it gets worse. So after this particular event, a few weeks later, this is the 2nd of March, 2009, we have 37 year old Daniel Plowman. Now he's at the time in this on off relationship with Huckabee. Um, he went to church with her. She'd actually told him that she was pregnant now at this point, he's a good guy. And he actually said that he wanted to marry her. All we can say now is, Daniel, very lucky escape, mate. Very lucky escape. You probably would have ended up baked in some pie served to the congregation at a later date. I'm using artistic license there. I have no evidence that she would have cannibalized anybody. But this is a reality that she's managed to have a relationship with somebody, on and off it might be, but obviously she's built this relationship. He's clearly in a situation where he cares for her. And when she says that she's pregnant, he wants to do the right thing. Although we can all imagine that this is just another fantasy of this very, very strange individual. So at this point, when he's offered to marry her and they're kind of having this conversation, she says to him, here, have some vitamin water. Now, I don't know about you, but I personally have had vitamin water regularly. In fact, it's one of those things that I'll have if it's on offer in a supermarket, not necessarily because of the vitamins in it, but because I like the shape of the bottle and I like cheaper stuff. And so essentially it's a common water that you will know and what you can't taste are the vitamins. Otherwise it wouldn't be called vitamin water. It would be called something else because it'd have a weird taste, wouldn't it? So he ends up, obviously drinking this and at the time think this just tastes like liquid aspirin. Now I have no idea why anybody who's handed water starts to drink it and thinks well this is tasting like liquid aspirin, that really nice refreshing drink, why they wouldn't think I'm just going to pour myself another one because your vitamins taste a little bit off. But after he drank it he remembers nothing else, just wakes up in jail. And it turns out, even though he has no memory whatsoever of the event, that he'd been arrested for driving under the influence. And it was bad. They actually found him passed out behind a wheel at a McDonald's drive through There's a little bit of me that respects the fact that in spite of the fact he was heavily inebriated in the influence of drugs that he was unaware he'd taken, that he still managed to get to McDonald's. I imagine that they probably 
arrived at the drive through to hand him his McDonald's burgers and then they realised he's totally passed out, but he'd managed to get there. And I think that that says that sometimes our stomach is in control of our actions. But when he wakes up, he's in a complete shock. So he claims he's innocent. He says to the police, I do not drink. I do not do drugs. I don't take illicit drugs. And everybody who knew him, they said, you've got the wrong guy. This is not his kind of behaviour whatsoever. So they do the tests, obviously, to check whether he has got alcohol in his system or drugs in his system. And it shows that there aren't illegal drugs or high levels of alcohol in his system. But what they do find is the presence of a benzodiazepine. So again, related to Huckabee. And what is Huckabee doing now? Drugging an adult. So she's tested it on a child. She's tested it on an adult. Is she trying to figure out the ideal amount required to essentially knock somebody out for a period of time? Now, sadly, Daniel never actually reported Huckabee to police. And I think that that's probably down to the fact that he had feelings for her or that he just wanted to deny that there was any reality that this is the kind of thing that she would do because it's a horrifying thing to imagine that you've been spending time with somebody who would do those kind of things to you and cause you imminent danger and others imminent danger because you got behind the wheel of a car because that's what we're talking about. You know, this isn't just about a man being drugged. This is about a man being drugged who then got in a car and could have caused absolute chaos and devastation and she was willing for that to happen. So that shows you how malevolent the psychology of this individual is. She has no care, concern, or consequential thoughts about the actions that she is carrying out. All she wants to do is figure things out for herself. If that kills lots of people, in the actual reality of her doing that, that's irrelevant to her. She's concentrating on her own goals. Now at this point, I feel like the police have got enough evidence to literally throw the book at her. She's banged to rights without a shadow of a doubt. But the case is strengthened even further when a witness actually comes forward and they've got this crucial evidence because they'd seen Huckabee on the TV report about Sandra's disappearance. Now, this guy instantly remembers her. So he's a retired Marine and he actually owned the land where poor Sandra's body had been found. But on the day of the disappearance of Sandra, he and his wife had basically spotted this woman that they felt was acting really, really strangely in the vicinity of the irrigation pond. They said that she'd seemed really distracted. She seemed in a hurry when he'd approached her. Now, she had said to him, look, the reason that I've come here is just I need the toilet. And he said that was between 5.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. Now, that's the exact time frame from when she'd left the church and then returned half an hour later. Now, having seen Huckabee on the TV, he was absolutely convinced that it was her that he'd spoken to. And he gave a description to the police that exactly matched Huckabee and also the clothes that she'd been wearing that day. But there was another thing that made her stand out to him. She was driving this really distinctive SUV. And one of the things that spoke to him was it had a sticker on it referring to the fact that her brother was a Marine. Now, because he had been one himself, that had stuck in his mind. Obviously, Marines are a really tight fit unit and they are individuals who consider themselves in a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And the logistics of that mean that when they see things related to themselves, it sticks. So he's able to really reference the reality of seeing her at the scene of the crime. So now the FBI don't just have evidence linking Huckabee to Sandra's murder. Now they've got evidence linking her to the scene where poor Sandra's body had been dumped. So it gets to the 10th of April 2009. And I can imagine that the officers were just desperate to arrest this woman because this is a very, very dangerous human being. It's as simple as that. And they've turned up all these additional information that suggests she is planning, she is premeditative, she has been dangerous before and risked people's lives by drugging them. This is an individual with real form and potential to carry out more crimes. So on the 10th of April 2009, Huckabee, thank God, is arrested. She's charged with Sandra's kidnapping, rape and murder. And bear in mind, they've turned up all this other information that shows what a malevolent and dangerous human being Huckabee is. They found out that she's been drugging people. And bear in mind, that could have killed people. She's done strange searches. She's got a real predisposition for harm. And also, if she was out on the streets, why wouldn't she do these things again? Now she's got a taste for rape and murder. In fact, 
it could be that she's been engaged in rape, for example, before. We don't know. We know that she's drugged other kids. I mean, that in itself is deeply disturbing. And we know that she's got access to very high level drugs that can cause issues where people don't even know what's happened to them. Now, they believe that it played out like this. She'd essentially abducted the little girl and then she drugged her. At this point, she'd taken her to the church. That's where she had sexually assaulted her. Then she'd beaten her and she'd strangled her, after which she had placed her body in that suitcase of hers and she'd gone and dumped her in the pond. She'd then written the note which detailed where the body could be found and the reason that she'd written it is because she knew exactly where the body was. And then several days later, she'd actually swallowed that razor blade because that was an acknowledgement of her guilt. So it's a very, very strong case. It's as simple as that. Of course, Huckabee isn't going to let it lie that this is how the reality of the crime occurred. So she says, no, it looks really incriminating, but you've got it wrong. So basically, yes, I was involved in what happened to Sandra, but you are making out that I'm a murderer and I'm not. It was a complete accident. So she says what actually happened was Sandra came over. She wanted to play with my daughter. They wanted to play hide and seek. And we we're all playing hide and seek. And basically she suggested that Sandra hide in a suitcase. Now, I don't know about you. And it might be, I don't know, a few decades since I played hide and seek. But I'm pretty sure that the whole aim of hide and seek is that those involved don't know where you're hiding until they find you. So the reality of that is if you're playing hide and seek, you're not going to be zipping someone in a suitcase because automatically you'll be like, oh, I found you. You're in the suitcase. I just zipped up. It reminds me of the case of Sarah Moon. Not covered that yet. But at the end of the day, she locks her boyfriend in a case and then he dies. And essentially, again, she says, oh, we were just playing hide and seek. No, you weren't. You were essentially killing him. But in this case, this is how she's deflecting. She's saying, you know, at the end of the day, she just wanted to hide in the suitcase. I zip her up in that suitcase and I totally forget about her. Totally forget about her. I just go to church. Just think about that. She believes that her line of defense is that she zips this child in this suitcase and then is so neglectful, criminally neglectful, that she goes to church. And then she suddenly realizes later on that Sandra is still inside the suitcase, and sadly she's already dead, because she's suffocated. She then says, at this moment in time, I get really panicky because I think I'm gonna get into trouble, which she would do. And so she decides that it's far easier to just go and dump the body in the suitcase into the irrigation pond. Now, that makes absolutely no sense. Sorry, just let's go through this, Huckabee. Just talk to me about what happened. Okay, so basically we were playing a game of hide and seek where I actually knew where she was because I put her in the suitcase. That's not a game of hide and seek, then it's just a game of seek. That's likely true. I haven't thought this one out thoroughly though. But then I, having done that, and being completely of sound mind, apparently, not under the influence, because I was going to church and I drove, I forgot about her. And then I realised that she was dead when I got back. And then I thought, well, I could just tell the truth and show people it was an accident. But I thought it was probably less incriminating to dump her body in an irrigation pond and then fabricate the fact that she'd been abducted and murdered. You are going to go to prison for one million years. Genuinely, what is she thinking? How does that even make sense? But this is her, again, trying to get away with it. So that's why I won't have this mental health issue and the concerns that we've had about her in the background regarding her mental illness brought into this. This is somebody trying to get away with murder and a heinous murder as well. So the evidence, of course, does not support any of what she said. And another thing that's really obvious is there's no way this little girl would have got into that suitcase because she was so tightly packed into it. She wouldn't have felt safe in any way, shape or form. She's been shoved in there and it's a very tight fit. Now, initially, Huckabee, she says not guilty to every single one of the charges, which is just unbelievable because, of course, that means that the family is going to have to go through a heinous trial. And it does seem that the case is indeed heading for trial. The prosecution said, when we go to trial, we are seeking the death penalty. This 
particular case deserves the death penalty. But it's at this point when, I don't know, Huckabee is given the absolute overwhelming amount of evidence that demonstrates that no one else could have done it. At this point, she ultimately says, oh, you know what, I'll take a plea deal. So she's offered this plea deal from prosecutors. And the way that she pled was that she said she was guilty to Sandra's kidnapping and murder in May 2010. And because she does that, she avoids the death penalty. Another thing that they drop is the rape charge against her and also two other charges which were connected to the drugging of the seven-year-old girl and her former boyfriend, which personally I don't think they should have done. You're a rapist and a child molester and you're also somebody who could have killed another two people minimum. And I don't think that you should just be given the sentence for the kidnapping and killing of this little girl. Her family, I believe, deserve full justice, but essentially plea deals do that. And she subsequently does get sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That's in June 2010. And I also fully appreciate that the prosecution know that what matters is years inside and knowing that society will never have to have her walking the streets again. But again, for me, it's a sting in a tail when a child has been so badly violated and it's not necessarily represented in the charges and in the sentencing that occurs. Now, when Huckabee is sentenced and she is so weird in court, she's so odd. And when she's actually there for the sentencing itself, she's noticeably larger, she's got shorter hair, and she does apologize to Sandra's family, but it just feels to me ultimately all about her. She says, I should not have taken her from you. No shit, Sherlock, really? Is that your starting point? I should not have taken her from you. I think we can all agree that everybody with one brain cell onwards knows that you shouldn't have taken her, you malevolent monster. And she claimed that she had no explanation for her actions, which doesn't make sense. And I'll tell you why it doesn't make sense. Because she planned it, she premeditated it, she prepped it, she rehearsed it. She carried it out on two other people to see what drugs could have an impact on their psyche. And then she went ahead and sexually violated and murdered a child. You don't have an explanation for it. No, you don't want to explain it. That's a far bigger reality. You don't want to stand in court and say, it is because I am a child molesting murderer. And don't get me wrong, people disagree with what I've just said. People disagree with her being a child molesting monster. They really do, but I don't care because, well, essentially this is my channel and that child deserves to have what happened to her given legacy and reality. She also said, I still cannot understand why I did what I did. This is a question I will struggle with for the rest of my life. Really? Will it really make you struggle for the rest of your life? I don't think so. It's a question you will struggle with. It's about you. What are you on about? You absolutely violated and ended the life of this child and dumped her like rubbish in an irrigation pond. And you're going to struggle with why you did it? Well, I imagine that's a million times more difficult for her loving family who had that little girl stolen from them. She told Sandra's mother that her daughter hadn't suffered. You murdered her. She had injuries that were horrific, but she hadn't suffered. She also stood in court and denied that she'd actually sexually assaulted her. How unbelievable is that? She had fully sexually violated her, but again, minimizing and projecting that it's not really her fault. That's a whole fabrication by the investigators when the evidence is absolutely clear, where that child's body speaks to it, where they find the object that she had used against her. And she actually said this, she did not suffer. I did not sexually molest her. I'm asking you, Maria, for your forgiveness. I can't imagine forgiving someone who harmed my daughter. I hope someday you can forgive me. Guess what? The line, I can't imagine forgiving someone who did that to my daughter. Yeah, I reckon that's how everybody who hears about this case feels about Huckabee. No one's going to forgive you. Not God themselves. You are going to have a long eternity burning so that you can reflect on the actions that you carried out. And the fact that she's showing this slight remorse, not full remorse, is evident of her nature. It really is. Words cannot convey 
It is not enough that I say I'm sorry, but that is all I can do. From the day Sandra has died, I've had to live with the consequences of what I've done. For the rest of my life, I'm going to have to live with this. I feel responsibility for her death. Not a day, not an hour. Goodbye. So they don't think of the harm that I caused. I loved Sandra a great deal. She was sweet and a little girl who did not deserve to have such a short life. I alone are responsible for Sandra's death. I would like to apologize directly to you, Maria, for all the pain that I have caused you. I should not have taken Sandra from you. And I want you to know that she did not suffer and I did not sexually molest your daughter. I would also like to apologize to Sandra's extended family. I know that I have caused you a great deal of grief, but I am truly sorry. I would also like to apologize to my own family for what I have put them through. I am grateful that they have continued to stand by me, and I thank you for your unconditional love and support. I know how hard this has been for you as well, but you continue to stand by me and I can't tell you how much that means to me. But I'd also like to apologize to my own daughter, who I lost. I hope that someday you will forgive me. I love you a great deal and I hope to see you again someday soon. I owe an apology to the people of Tracy. These officers who spent so much time looking for Sandra, I know that this has touched each of you personally, and for that I'm truly sorry. But I know in my heart that God has forgiven me, and I know my family has forgiven me, and I'm asking you, Maria, for your forgiveness. I can't imagine forgiving somebody who would harm my own daughter. But I hope that someday you can forgive me. Maria, I wish I could give you an explanation for what happened. I owe you an explanation. I still cannot understand why I did what I did. Every day I try to discover my motivation, but I still do not have an answer. This is a question I will struggle with for the rest of my life. I wish that I could do more to help you. I wish I could bring Sandra back, but I can't. I wish I could trick places with her, but I can't do that either. I know that Sandra's death will continue to cause you pain. And I hope that this apology will help you in some way by accepting responsibility for what I have done. I hope that I can give you some peace. Thank you. The evidence when it came down to that rape is indisputable. Sandra had suffered a horrific sexual assault. As I said, the object had been identified, it had been confirmed via DNA. There was no way that Sandra's DNA could have found its way onto that rolling pin. She didn't even attend Huckabee's freaking church where it was found. So she's lying at a moment where she's meant to be taking responsibility for the horror that she's caused that poor family. As far as I'm concerned, Huckabee is in denial about the type of monster that she is, a monster she absolutely is. Now, an FBI profiler, they concluded the offence hadn't been sexual. But there again, the FBI profiler had also said it was a male they were looking for. So arguably, do we take that into the context of reality or do we question it? I think we question it. He said that it was a more likely to be an attention-seeking behaviour, like a form of Munchausen's by proxy syndrome, factitious disorder, and that this was a way that she wanted to be the centre of attention. 
So this is why she couldn't resist texting Sandra's mother about the stolen suitcase. This is why she couldn't resist saying that she'd found the note in the trailer park. So not only did she want to be the perpetrator, she wanted to be the person who solved the crime, obviously by deflecting that it was somebody else, but that she was the hero in this story. So they're kind of using that scenario where she is essentially the hero and that's the Munchausen's by proxy connection. But for me... I just think that if this was a male, at the end of the day, we have serial killers like BTK. People don't go, oh, he had Munchausen's by proxy when he was sexually violating children. And he inserted himself in the case, wrote to the police, gave them clues, etc. No one's saying that that was not sexually motivated. It was. Why is it different? Because she's a female. I just think throwing in the Munchausen's by proxy is letting her off very leniently. And this is sexually based. She violated this child and it should be known that she violated this child. Also, they believe that Huckabee's daughter might have been a victim of her actions. And again, this is why they're tying in that whole idea about Munchausen's by proxy. So she was apparently very often in hospital. She needed hospital treatment. But for me, it's absolutely hard to reconcile, if not impossible to reconcile, that that's the sole reason for her actions. When you look at the facts, why are we not looking at the facts? It just annoys me, this bias towards females in these cases. It is possible that females are heinous, monstrous, murderers and sexual predators. The sexual element of the crime, as far as I'm concerned, just speaks volumes. And as I said, if that offender had been male, a different conclusion would have been reached without a shadow of a doubt. Now, I suppose one could argue, well, maybe what she did was she violated Sandra because she wanted to throw investigators off the trail, i.e. to make them believe that a male perpetrator was responsible for the killing. However, could it not just be that Huckabee is an anomaly in the world of crime? A lone predatory female paedophile. We have seen this before. I've done the Vanessa George case. Look that up. These individuals exist. Simple as. Now, according to the FBI statistics, these kind of perpetrators are involved in just 7% of murders of any kind. So it is rare for women to do it, but they still do it. And don't get me wrong, when it comes down to the fact that she would have done this by herself, that's even more unusual because we do often see that they're linked with other male perpetrators. But think about what she did in her life. She was somebody who was a Sunday school teacher. Perpetrators and predators place themselves in positions where they can exploit the type of victim that they are interested in, placed her in a position of responsibility. The victim profile of those kids were the age group that she's actually acted on before. Also, when she was younger, she used to babysit, she used to work as a nanny. So she certainly has this connection towards young children. And on the whole, people who want to work as nannies and with babysitters because they love kids. But also, if you're attracted to them, if you want to cause them harm, if you get off on violating them, you're going to place yourself in those positions of responsibility. So she could have been the perfect chameleon. At the time, particularly when she was young, she was attractive, female, well-spoken, no one would have suspected her. You would have trusted her with your kids. And when you think about that earlier drugging of the seven-year-old, they believe that when she did that to that kid and her boyfriend, it was just a test run for the ultimate crime. As far as I'm concerned, she is a sexual predator. She wanted a victim to be compliant. She had ready access to all the prescription drugs that could achieve this. She knew what she was doing and she went ahead and did it. And I hate the minimization because even though Munchausen's by proxy is a horrific diagnosis that means you've done great damage, it is not the same as raping and murdering a child. And she should be known as a rapist and a murderer. Now, Huckabee, she remains incarcerated at the Central California Women's Facility in Chachilla. So this is somewhere that obviously she's going to spend a very long period of time, if not forever. At least she's never going to walk the streets. And I imagine when she takes her last breath, Beelzebub is going to be there with the Grim Reaper having a right good laugh about what's going to happen to her next. I imagine there's going to be some very large objects involved that are very, very hot. Eight-year-old Sandra, the person who matters most in this video today, she was buried in her hometown of Tracy. And they actually have a little 
Hello Kitty notebook that sits on a bench in front of a grave. And the reason it's there is that they want visitors to leave messages for her. And it's a tragedy beyond belief that that's the only connection that the local community can now have with that beautiful child who pleased everyone and everybody loved. You know, she would have gone on to live a good future, loved by her family, embraced by her community because she deserved it. And because as a child, she had that personality and character that warranted such praise. I cannot wrap my head around today's case, guys. I really can't because I genuinely feel that this woman should have been charged and sentenced for the violation of that little girl. I hate the minimization of the Munchausen's by proxy. I disagree fully with the profiler. I know that I wasn't involved in the case and it's just my own thoughts towards it. But like I said, if the shoe was on the other foot and it was a male perpetrator, we wouldn't be having this conversation because you all know they would have been considered absolutely a sexual predator. And so too, Huckabee should go down in history as a violent sexual child predator, murderer and rapist. It's as simple as that. And I will not have anyone else, as far as I am concerned, ever change my mind on this point of fact, as far as I am concerned. I'd love to know your thoughts. I know that we are all deeply moved when a child dies, let alone is murdered in some reprehensible ways. Do you agree with me? Do you feel that we're dealing with somebody who is a chameleon living in plain sight, a predator who surrounded herself with the victim profile that she was interested in? Or do you agree with the FBI profiler who also thought it was a male who carried out the attack? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Let me know your feelings about this case. Thank you so much for joining me. And as ever in these cases, this video is absolutely for Sandra. It's her name we should remember. It's the joy she brought to this world that should be absolutely embraced. And it's the memory of a life lost, but a life up until that point fully lived. That's her legacy, that she was loved, that she lived fully, that her life was shorter than it should have been. But my God, she was absolutely celebrated and embraced by the people who rightly adored her. Take care, guys. Be safe.